which today we're going to be talking about narcissists. Um, specifically, how can you spot a narcissist? Um, this is a question that I get often. I actually got this question recently uh, in a session, and I just thought this is a really good topic to discuss because uh, for those of us who are healing, uh, who are survivors, as we start to make progress, we don't want to end up back in another relationship with a narcissist or another abusive relationship. So we find ourselves asking, how can I avoid that? How can I make sure I don't end up again back with another narcissist? Uh, we might feel like we have a tendency to just attract these people. We might wonder, what is it about me that the narcissists always seem to find me? Do I have a sign on my head that, that I am, you know, come and pick on me like I'm the person uh, for you if you're a narcissist, if you've got emotional wounds and problems, uh, come and date me? Is, is that what I have written across my shirt? We, we start to feel that way because uh, we feel like we've been in these relationships with these bad boys or these mean women. Again and again, we keep getting into these relationships with these people who end up having our best interests not at heart and end up using us and abusing us. This might not be physical abuse. In fact, some of the worst scars come from the emotional abuse, the deprivation, the neglect. So I was out riding my scooter at nighttime, just getting some fresh air. And um, there were these people on the street. I live in a, a busy area in Chicago. And there are these girls talking. And this girl says to her friend, she says, well, I'm a really good judge of character. And I heard that phrase. And I've heard that so many times. I, and it made me think, she's a good judge of character. Every, so many people say that. But I work in this industry as a professional with people day in and day out. And I can tell you, there is no way to detect just by meeting someone automatically if they are a narcissist, if they're a dangerous person, if they're a psychopath or not. Because sure, empaths tend to be loving and they care about other people, but their traits can be faked. They can be mimicked. And there are actors who are just absolutely phenomenal at appearing to be something they're not. That's why we, we pay big money to see these really talented actors. In fact, there's some actors like Gary Oldman and Melissa Leo. You may have barely even know their name, but if you see a movie with them in it, and you've probably seen many, you don't even realize they're in the movie because they're so good. They can blend in and become any person virtually. And there are psychopaths, there are narcissists that are all around us that, that can blend in the same way. In fact, if you're sitting at a table with, with five of your friends, at least one of those people, statistically speaking, is probably a narcissist. Um, even more are metaphysically dangerous in some other way because they may have some other disorder or some other uh, psychopathy that, that made them not a good choice to be a, a, an intimate partner. So how can you keep yourself safe when there are so many people who are so dangerous to you? And, and knowing that many of these people have good acting skills, good blending in skills, how will you know? In fact, your, your efforts to detect who's who don't stand a chance because these narcissists have been practicing since infancy their craft. That's longer than the best actors in Hollywood. They've been practicing since birth how to appear to be something they're not. So, so how can you actually detect a narcissist? Well, what I want to do is actually elevate the conversation so that we can understand really what we're talking about when, when we use this term narcissist. In popular psychology, this term has just been used and is getting overused to the point where where people are pointing at everyone and anything that they don't like and saying, well, that's a narcissist and, and, and that's narcissistic. Uh, so a more, a more accurate term that I like to transition to is 
ego path. Because in, in pop psychology, we use this term empath, and, and that term doesn't actually come from science. It comes from science fiction. Uh, but it's a really good term for, for people who are led with empathic energy. An empath is someone who feels the feelings and emotions of another person. They're empathic or empathetic. which both have the same meaning. An, an empath is someone, though, that, that can become actually overwhelmed with other people's feelings, other people's thoughts, other people's problems, to where they start to lose themselves, trying to help people, take care of people, and please people. They can try to perform at high levels so that they can get some type of love, some type of affection, some type of attention and validation, because they don't have that love, affection, attention, validation from within. So these, these empaths can can actually end up losing themselves trying to be everything for everyone. The narcissists, as I'm referring to as egopaths, are the opposite of the empaths, but they come from the same origin. It comes from a place of being a prisoner of war, being tortured, and or having parents that are emotionally immature. These emotionally immature parents who themselves are egopathic uh, or a combination of having an egopathic uh, parent and an empathic parent raises you in a household that is unhealthy. Depending on how egopathic your, your egopath parent was, they abuse the children emotionally and mentally. On top of that, possibly physically and sexually as well. So these egopathic characters, these narcissists are very dangerous to the child and the child then develops in a way that typically is unhealthy. So the child will learn in, in order for me to get the love that I want, I have to become either, either egopathic myself and be all about me and kill everyone else, destroy anyone else, manipulate anyone in my path. Or I have to become that extreme empath because I don't want to give up love and I don't want to hurt anyone. And I have to give up myself. So I'm going to give up my ego. I'm going to lay down. I'm going to be that doormat. And I'm going to allow people to get whatever they want from me. I'm not going to try to protect myself. And as a result of being that type of person, they get victimized again and again and again in their lives. Most empaths have been in multiple toxic relationships with abusive narcissists. So I'm going to show you a, a chart if you're on Zoom here with me. For those who are just joining us, we're talking about how to spot a narcissist. And I'm using a, uh, a, um, a term to describe narcissists that's a little bit more broad which is egopath. So if you're on Zoom with me and you take a look at this chart here, at the top of the chart, I have egopath. And then at the bottom of the chart, I have empath, okay? So what happens is there's a, a split in childhood when you are emotionally abused or emotionally neglected or mentally abused and mentally neglected. And you have to figure out how to get your emotional needs met. And so many children will split towards becoming narcissistic. They become egopathic and they go that, that direction of an egopath. And many go the opposite direction and they become hyper empathic and they give up the ego to survive. So you can see how this seems logical from a child's, child's perspective, right? If I just give up uh, my, my, my love for other people, my concern for other people that I can manipulate to get the love that I want, such as I can throw my brother and sister under the bus and say that they did this and frame them for things. Right. And, and that way mom and dad will like me above my brother and sister. And that's how that narcissist is born. That villain is born. Whereas for the empathic persons, which is most of us here in, in this, in this, uh, in this session, you may, decision, a choice in childhood, this could have been before you even had your memory, it could have been at two years old or, or even less, that, that you would do anything for, for more love, 
which was an emotional need. And so you're willing to give up the self. That means you're going to hide your emotions. It means you're going to stifle your thoughts, uh, stifle what you want, uh, not admit to, to who you truly are, and just become anything you need to be in order to please your parents uh, or to please the caregiver. Because for you, the most important thing was to get some of that love, get some drops of validation or affection. And so you went that empathic route. Now, right in the middle, middle of this chart. So at the top, we got ego paths. At the bottom, we have the empaths. Right in the middle of the chart is balance. This is where you're headed to when you're trying to heal from CPTSD. That's complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Where you're trying to head is to this balance, actualization. An actualized person is neither egopathic or empathic. They are a little bit of both. They have the perfect balance. Do we want to have some egopathic traits? Well, you need to have a strong ego to be healed. The reason why you are victimized again and again and again and again and you end up in relationships with narcissists again and again and again and again is because of your small to non-existent ego. You do not show up as a whole complete person. You do not show up with strength. So in order to become actualized, you must actually rebuild, re-strengthen the ego so that you have a full complete sense of self and you are viewing the sense of self as equal to your sense of everyone else. Does that make sense? Egopathic people are doing the opposite. They're viewing themselves as superior to everyone else and or viewing everyone else as inferior to them. That's why they have the stories every day about how everyone at work was so stupid or everyone is so mean to them or everyone is terrible or everyone doesn't, doesn't do enough and they do everything, and they are the best, and they are the smartest, and they are, right, because they're always trying to boost up, elevate themselves, elevate their ego. So they use tactics against you as the empathic person to enslave you to them. Ultimately, what they're looking to do is to create a dynamic where you're in a relationship with each other, and you're relying on them for something, but they can be above you. It's very important for them to be, in their minds, superior to you. So, so they try to create a dynamic with you where you feel like you're getting some validation. You feel like you're getting some love or some value from being in a relationship with them. But meanwhile, they will rob you of your natural resources. And that's the goal of, of a narcissist, is to rob you of your natural resources. Natural resources, by the way, are your time, your energy your attention, your affection, your body, your looks, your presence, all of those things are very valuable. You don't even see those things as valuable because you have no sense of self. You don't know what you have to offer. So you feel like, I, oh my gosh, someone loves me. I'll, well, this is great. I'll do anything for this. That's because of not having your, your ego intact. So you're, you're happy to get any type of love and the narcissist is like, perfect. This is the perfect prey. So if you're taking a look at, at, my, at my chart here, actualize is in the middle. That's balance. That's where you want to head. When someone is a number one or a number, a number one on either side or a zero or they're actualized, I consider them to be healed. We're trying to move you towards healing. So you want to be either exactly balanced between having a strong ego and strong empathy, or you can be slightly higher in ego or you can be slightly higher in empathy. Both are acceptable. Outside of that, we start getting to unhealthy areas. So a level two egopath, we wouldn't necessarily call them a narcissist. And that's the importance of this chart, to understand that this is a spectrum of graduality. So, so when you go up from, from level one, you got a strong ego, but you go to level two, now you have someone who is ambitious, they're hardworking, they have a strong sense of self, they do have a capacity to show empathy, to show care for other people, but they do tend to favor things that are for themselves. They favor the self. Uh, they have disfavor and displeasure toward other people. You may hear them 
uh, say that they have a disdain for other people. When you go up from that, you're getting into dangerous levels now. A level two egopath, you wouldn't even necessarily consider them to be a narcissist. Whereas at level three, they're one step from having narcissistic personality disorder. You know it's a disorder when it creates an interruption in your life. That's when you know it's a disorder. So on the other side, empaths are at a disordered level, CPTSD, when their complex post-traumatic stress actually disrupts their life. It keeps them from being able to make as much money. It keeps them from being able to have friends, have relationships. It keeps them from being able to advance in life. Does that make sense? So that would be a disorder because it's disrupting your life, your relationships, your career. It's the same for narcissists. When they get to the point where their narcissism actually disrupts their own lives or the lives of others, it is now a disorder. And that's where you get narcissistic personality disorder. Examples of, of that are they're hurting people to the point of driving those people, uh, so to speak, mad where uh, they're, they're going to the hospital or they're getting put on medication. They're using gaslighting and lying and manipulating. They may be doing crimes that, are, that would put them in, in jail or behind bars. Um, they've gotten to a point where they're willing, in order to kill and destroy you, they're willing to actually sacrifice their own selves and their own well-being just to hurt the other person. And that's where you have someone at a disordered level. That next level down would be in a level three there, we would call them a narcissist, but they would not be diagnosed with the disorder, right? So you're referring to them as a narcissist. I'm referring to them as a level three ego path. And a level three ego path, they're at dangerous levels. So they're willing to hurt you. They're willing to stomp on you. They're willing to use you. These are these people are your coworkers. They're at work. They're in your family. They are everywhere. They do not represent one in five. They represent more than that. There are more than one in five level three egopathic people. They would represent something like 30% of the population. Is that like a level three uh, or more? So I'm including level four narcissistic personality disorder people. And so you see the same, the same thing goes with empathic people. It's, it's in levels, it's in stages. And so when you get down to a three and four, uh, the empathic person is, is at a dangerous level where they're prioritizing other people's emotions, feelings, thoughts, desires above themselves. So they're living their life basically like a slave out in the world, just trying to please everyone all the time. And since that's not sustainable, that's how, how it starts to creep into becoming a disorder. And they can end up crashing, losing their lives, developing mental disorders as a result. So hopefully that starts to shed a little bit of light on, on how this really works. When we're talking about narcissists, what we're really referring to is egopathic people on various levels. So now this brings us to our original question. How in the world do we protect ourselves from these narcissists? How do we spot them? Well, going through life thinking that you have a psychic ability to judge people's character, that's not real. Don't, I, I, know, I know it's popular to say that and to think like that, but you can stop. You cannot, you're not a good judge of people's character. Because if I work in this industry and I can walk up, meet someone face to face and have no idea if they are a narcissist or not, I don't think there's a chance that you not working in the, in the field of psychology are really going to walk up to people and just know. It's not going to happen. Occasionally it could happen. Occasionally you can make a good guess. When people say I'm a good judge of character, what they really do is they just generally um, decide that everyone is dangerous. And then when they're proved right, they say, oh, yeah, I'm a good judge of care. I knew that person was dangerous, <laughs> but really they have no idea what they're doing. So, so it's better for you to recognize that no one knows. It's energy. A person's thoughts and emotions are energy. You do not really know. Someone manifests their character through over time through actions. People manifest their character over time through actions. So you can say, 
You can start talking about someone's character when time has passed and you've seen action after action after action after action. Then it's reasonable that you might say, oh, you know, I think this person is a little bit egotistical or this person is a little bit uh, traumatized. Then you can start to get some ideas of where a person's character is over time, demonstrate through action. You're not going to walk up to someone and say, oh, I'm a good judge of character. I met them over dinner and I know. You have no idea what you're talking about. There is no way to know. People people make mistakes all the time on trying to determine if someone's a narcissist or not. So how do you know if they're, if they're a dangerous person, if they're a fake or a counterfeit? Well, look at, look at how you determine if a dollar bill is a counterfeit. For instance, the $100 bill, they have special pens. These pens, they use to mark the bill to determine if that bill is a counterfeit. How do these pens work? Well, these pens are iodine pens. The iodine in the pen, if the paper is, is derived from wood, will leave a black mark on the $100 bill, exposing it as a fraud, as a counterfeit. Because real $100 bills are made on fibrous paper, fiber-based paper. So if you mark them with this pen, it will not leave a black stain. So by using this pen and seeing how it interacts with the material that this bill is made out of, that's what exposes what it really is. Likewise, me telling you how to spot a narcissist is not me giving you all the traits of a narcissist because you cannot get all the traits of a counterfeit bill. There's so many different ways to be a counterfeit bill. There's a lot of different ways to be a counterfeit person. They come in all shapes and sizes. There's a lot of different ways to be a dangerous person. What you have to do is you have to become the iodine pen. You have to have a way of determining through your interaction, exposing what they truly are. So how do you do that? You will be able to expose if a narcissist or a person is dangerous, or if a person is a narcissist or an egopath, by setting firm boundaries and enforcing them, by being a boundaried person, that makes you an iodine pen. Here's a great place to start. Stop being nice. Don't be so nice. Niceness is not a characteristic you should aspire to. Nice is defined in the, in the dictionary as agreeable. That's not helpful. Being agreeable can be false. It can come from a place of manipulating people. In fact, people pleasers notoriously, notoriously are manipulators. People pleasers aren't telling you the truth. People pleasers will say, oh, yeah, sure, yeah, mm, yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, mm, yeah, sure, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> they're smiling, going along with the plan, and in their inside, they're like, ah, I hate this. That's false. Don't be false. Don't be nice. Stop being nice. Be kind. Be a kind person. Kind is defined as generous in the dictionary. A generous person comes from a place of abundance and power. So they give of their kindness out of love. They're motivated by love. Someone who's nice is either motivated by manipulation or fear. So you're being nice because you're afraid that people won't like you or they're going to abandon you. Stop that. No. Or someone who's nice, oh, they're being so nice, but they're really just trying to use you. Stop that. No. Don't be nice. Be kind. Stop being nice. Be a boundary person. Be a principled person. A nice person will feel the need to, to give money to every beggar. A kind person won't do that, but they will set up a hunger drive and feed the homeless. That's kindness. So there's a difference between kindness and niceness. And it's, it's subtle. It's deep. You're going to have to not be a superficial person to grasp what you really have to be. Your deepest motivation needs to be love. 
Okay, and you need to be motivated by dreams. Egotistical people, the ego paths have that over the empaths. They know how to have a vision of the future and move towards it and accomplish their goals. They accomplish their missions. They're awake. Narcissistic people are not excused. Just because we say it's a disorder, they're not excused from their actions. They're responsible for their actions because they're awake. They realize that they are using, manipulating people. They realize they're hurting people. They just don't care. They've sacrificed their empathy long ago, like when they were three or four. They sacrificed it long ago. They don't care. Okay, so so, so you don't need to feel sorry for these narcissists. Well, they have a disorder. Maybe I can help them. No, you can't. Only they can decide, hey, I would like to become a decent human being. Nobody can help them to be a decent human being. Ha they have to make that decision for themselves. Hey, you know, I think I would like to become decent. Meanwhile, for you as an empath, you need more of an ego. You need to become more self-aware and self-focused so that you actually recognize I'm a human being too. I have something to offer here. And these natural resources have to be protected. When you realize that you're important, you realize you have something to protect. What are your natural resources? Time, money, your attention, your affection, right? Your energy. These are your natural resources. So you have to look at yourself like a sovereign nation that has natural resources that other enemy nations are trying to plunder. It is your job to protect your natural resources. So how does a nation protect their resources? They put up borders. What are borders? Boundaries. You have to have strong borders. And what do they do to the borders? They enforce their borders, don't they? They have border patrol, border protection. Right, countries enforce their borders to say, "Hey, if somebody tries to come in here and take our resources, they're going to get a boot, a boot in their butt." All right, <laughs> that has to be your attitude if you want to become an actualized person. You want to be able to detect narcissists. You have to become a boundary person with strong borders. How does this work? The reason why narcissists are attracted to you is because narcissists put feelers out and they're testing people. They test everyone. They test me. They test you. They test the guy down the street. They test police officers. They test everyone. It's just that when, when, when you took the test, the results came back as, oh, this person's a good victim, good narcissistic supply. This, this person's an easy prey. That's why you end up in relationships with narcissists, because they're running tests in your daily life. They are running tests. Have you been spotting the tests? Be aware. Your boundaries will be that iodine pen to expose them. How does this work? The narcissists are testing you. How are they testing you? Jokes. They make little jokes at work. You guys are socializing. You're out at a bar. They make little comments, little jokes. Sometimes it'll be at your expense. Sometimes it'll just be an off-color, inappropriate joke, like in a work situation. But they want to see how you respond. It is a test. They are aware. They are looking for prey. They say, who can I control? Who can I use so that I can go in and plunder the natural resources? I need someone without strong boundaries. So they're looking for those people who are like their little siblings that they used to beat up on people that they can manipulate, that they can use. So they use tests. So little jokes will be one thing. The other thing they'll use is uh, they'll ask favors. They'll just ask you for things. Hey, can you, can you grab the such and such over there? Can you hand me the so-and-so? Can you go get the, the such and such? And it seems so innocent at first. But what happens is that when you respond being nice, oh, sure, yeah, oh, here you go. Or they make the joke and you're laughing. <laughs> They've detected you. That's how the narcissists are finding you. You're making yourself easy prey. That's how they find you. They can always pass the joke off or pass the favor off in the beginning. So that if you were to stand up to them, they're going to be like, oh, come on, man. I was just making a joke. It was just a joke. Or, oh, I just was asking. Jeez, man, you don't have to be so mean. 
And you know that socially it would create awkwardness to say no and to set a boundary at these times. So you will comply and you go along with it. But you need to pay attention. They are running tests. The sooner you start saying no, the faster they'll be repelled out of your life and the safer you will be. Keeping yourself safe from narcissists does not entail that you stay in the house with the blinds closed and the doors locked. It's too extreme. You need to learn how to interact out in this world. So to do it, understand this is warfare. You're at war. Your nation has natural resources and there are enemy bigger nations out there that want to come in. They want to try to plunder your resources. So you have to set boundaries, which means you have to say no. Boundaries are borders. They are rules. There are moments where you say, um, I don't want to give you my time. I don't want to let you use my car, my material resources. No, I'm not going to let you. I'm not going to laugh at that joke. It's the moment you stop them and say, no, I'm not going to give any more of my resources to you. That is how you stop the narcissist and spot the narcissist. Because when they turn around and walk out of your life because you have boundaries, then you realize, holy smokes, that was a narcissist. The sooner you set the boundaries, the better. Don't wait until you're already married with three kids and then say, oh man, I need to set some boundaries. That happens to too many of us. That's when we realize, oh my gosh, I need to say no to this person. Well, boy, it's too late now. They've got all kinds of power in your life now. So please, this time, Set the boundary early when you're out at, and you're having dinner, you're having a beer, you're at work, and they asked you the first time you said yes, because you're just being nice, but you paid attention, you took note. So you're waiting to see if they do it again. Now they think they're running a test on you. You're running a test on them. Are they going to ask me again? Then the next time they ask you, you just say, uh, I, I mean, do I work for you? Bam. There are a thousand ways to say no. Um, is that what John wants us to do? Um, do I work for you? Are you my boss now? Um, not this time. Um, I'm not really sure. Pausing, taking your time, awkwardly staring, just using the, pronouncing the syllables N-O, saying, uh, I'm not really sure right now, asking if you can think about it. There are a thousand ways to say no. It's not about how you say no. It's just the fact that you put some resistance up. Because when they feel that you have border control, you have border protection, they go, oh, I don't like this. And they scram, especially if it's early in the game. Sometimes they'll try to push your border. So you will have to enforce them. How do you enforce your, how do you enforce your boundaries? Well, you have to be willing to involve the authorities because it might come down to that. What you should never do is be like, oh, man, they pushed past my boundary. I tried to set it. Sorry, Roman, I tried to set the boundary, but they pushed past it. That's not enforcing boundaries. You have to set and enforce boundaries in order to spot and deter nar narcissists. Set and enforce boundaries. So when an egopathic person pushes past your boundary, you got to be willing to involve authorities, whether that's at work, at school, or in the community. Be willing to involve the authorities. You got to remove yourself from the situation. You got to leave. That's enforcing your boundaries. Hey, can you please not talk about my mom? They do it again. Back up your stuff. Walk out. That's enforcing your boundaries. Or you tell your, your parents, hey, can you please not say anything negative about my husband? I don't appreciate that. They do it again. They push past your boundary. What do you do? Sit there? No. You have boundaries. When you set a rule, that's it. That's how your boundaries work. It's law because the rules, the boundaries are the outline of the ego. Now you're starting to have an ego. You're starting to understand the self. When you understand the self, you're healed. The rules that you create are the outline. They are the borderline of the self, the ego. You're saying, here's my line, mom and dad. Do not say anything bad about my girlfriend. They say something crazy. Just pack up your stuff quietly, walk out. Don't answer their text, don't answer their call. They're going to realize, holy smokes, this boy's got a boundary. They, 
Is, is it that simple? Yes, it's that simple. Is that always easy? No, not always. But you have to enforce your boundaries. There's a story Johnny Depp tells about his narcissistic mother. Um, and he says it's one of the best lessons that his mother ever taught him. And I want you to pay attention to this because sons of narcissistic mothers get trained to be narcissists. I had a narcissistic mother. It's the same thing. She tries to teach me the principles of how to be narcissistic. But the, the advice that they give is helpful when you're naturally empathic. Possibly Johnny Depp is naturally an empathic person. I too was naturally empathic. So I remember I was in the same situation and the same advice that his mom gave him, it's the same advice my mom gave me because he was getting picked on by bullies. He goes to his mom and says, mom, I'm getting picked on by these bullies. What do I do? His mom says, go up to that bully, go up to the biggest bully, punch him right in his face and you'll never be bullied again. <laughs> Johnny Depp says, yeah, I took the advice. I went up to the biggest bully, bam, punch him in his face and I was never bullied again. Why does that work? It's advice on how to deter narcissists from a narcissist because they know. So I did the same thing. My, I went to my mom. I was crying. <laughs> I'm being bullied. And my mom said, you, you don't come in this house, you know, blah, blah, blah. You don't get bullied. You win those fights. So you go out there and anybody that's bullying you, you look them in the face and you punch them right in the face. She gave me the same advice. But I was too empathic to really hit someone in their face. To this day, I have never been able to do that. But what I did was I grabbed the guy by his arm. He was calling me names. I told him to stop. He wouldn't stop. So I grabbed him by his arm. I swung him around, I swung him down on the ground. And I, I'm watching this guy rolling in the wood chips. I'm thinking, man, this is some extreme, some extreme actions to take. The guy gets up. I went to school with him from, from that point all the way through high school. He never called me another name again. More than that, I was also never bullied again. Now, how does this phenomenon work? It's not that you have to actually go out and enforce violence on people. That's not the actual answer. What it is, is that after you do that, you realize you're capable. In the moment, mentally, you realize that you will enforce your boundaries. When you walk around dangerous, like, oh, they better not. When you have that better not mindset, people sense it. And it makes it easier for you to set the small boundaries, put those warnings out there. Um, excuse me, what did you just say? Uh, uh, no, thank you. I, I won't be doing that today. You start setting those boundaries in your life. And that's why you never get bullied again. It's the lesson that we learned from how to go out there and enforce the boundary that stops us from falling into that same trap again. So now as we learn about narcissism, which is a little bit deeper than the playground bully situation, now we understand, and no, it's not that you need to go out and purposely hurt someone. But what you need to do is understand that you're capable of setting an outline of the self. That's your, bar, that's your boundaries, that's your borderline, and enforcing your borderline, enforcing your boundary. Know that you can. So I want you to meditate on a vision of you enforcing your boundary whether that means walking away, contacting the authorities, or taking, taking action if someone's actually attacking you to strike out in defense or to constantly resist if you're being assaulted. Picture yourself doing it now. Run the drill in your mind. By running that drill, you create a neural pathway. It makes you capable. Having that capability makes you confident. Having that confidence allows you to start setting smaller boundaries and enforcing them. And as a result, you won't need to spot the narcissist because you'll be repelling them. Hopefully this information was helpful to you. Um, hopefully you are taking notes. I will post this uh, discussion here on my YouTube. If you're looking to heal from narcissistic abuse, childhood trauma, emotional neglect, CPTSD, or anything in that family, you go to my website where it says learn from Roman, click there. There's an online course. You can enroll in it. 
and move right at your own pace and get yourself to healing. Also, set up sessions with me. I'll work with you on a weekly basis if necessary, help you get to healing. How long does it take? It's different for everyone. But many of my clients have healed within 12 to 14 weeks. They've gotten to a zero self-actualization or at least a one on my chart. So I look forward to working with you. Thank you so much for being here. Love you all. We have uh, 90 with us on TikTok and we have uh, 23 on, on Zoom. You guys have a good night.